Hello and happy Monday, May 11th. I hope you guys had a wonderful weekend and I hope that you celebrated your mom and that you had some good family time. I know that I did and I enjoyed my second Mother's Day also. So today, what is on the agenda? Today we are going to continue reading in Liddy. We're going to be reading chapter 21 and you have one assignment that is going to be chapter 21 questions on edsby so your learning target for today is i can answer text dependent questions from chapter 21. okay so i did want to before we start reading i wanted to draw your attention to this picture that i have here okay because the last chapter that was about bridget at the very end bridget is stuck in the factory with Mr. Marsden. Liddy walks in and sees that his arms are on Bridget's shoulders holding her down. So the first thing that comes to her mind is that she is going to take a water bucket and dump it straight on Mr. Marsden's head, runs out with Bridget, and that's where the end of the chapter was. So I have this picture here of the overseer here, and you can see they, these are adults. These are grown men, okay? And you have children that are working in here. You see how much smaller they are? So you can just imagine, you know, this is a real picture. Um, you can just imagine the size that Mr. Marsden was compared to the size of Bridget, this little girl, okay? That's not going to be a good situation. So we're going to see what happens after they leave. Do they go back to the corporation? Do they go back and continue to work? Do they get in trouble? What's going to happen? Okay, so we're going to find out with chapter 21 today. Okay, so let me go ahead and we're going to go to our book. And chapter 21 is called Turpitude. Turpitude, okay? So that's a weird word. You most likely have never heard this before. To be honest, I had never heard of it before I read this book. So hopefully we'll try to figure out what that means before um, the end of this chapter because it does mention it in the end, okay? So here we go with chapter 21. Make sure you're paying attention. Remember, you can always go back and rewind this video when you're going to do your questions, okay? Um, if you need to ever. All right, so here we go with turpitude. Remember, Bridget just ran out with Liddy. Liddy just hit Mr. Marsden over the head with a fire, a water bucket for the fires. Chapter 21. By morning, the laughter was long past. She was awake and dressed, pacing the narrow corridor between the beds before the 4.30 bell. Her breath caught high in her throat and her blood raced around her body undecided whether to run fire through her veins, searing her despite the November chill, or freeze to the icy rivulet of a mountain brook. She could not touch her breakfast. The smell of fried codfish turned her stomach, but she sat there amidst the chatter and clatter of the meal because it was easier to pass the time in the noise of company than in the raging silence of her room. She was the first at the gate. It wasn't that she was eager for the day to begin, but eager for it to be over. For whatever was to happen, and she did not doubt that something dreadful must happen, for whatever must happen, to be in the past. She tried not to think of Bridget. She could not take on Bridget's fate as well as her own. If only she had not come back up the stairs. Monster! Would I have wished to leave that poor child alone? Better to feed Rachel and Agnes to the bear. And yet, Bridget was not a helpless child. She might have broken loose, stomped his foot, or, well... It was too late for that, but he had gone back. She had, mercy on her, picked up that pail of filthy water and crammed it down on the overseer's neat little head. And all she had need to do was speak. When she had called his name, he had turned and let Bridget go. No, Liddy could not be satisfied. She had taken that pail and rammed it till the man's shoulders were almost squeezed up under the tin. The skin on her scalp crawled. Why didn't they open the gate? She was as weary of the scene in her head as if she'd actually picked up that heavy bucket and brought it down over and over again and run the length of the yard, dragging Bridget behind her a thousand times over, laughing. Of course he must have heard her. She had howled like a maniac. He must have heard. The other operatives were crowded about, jostling her as they all waited for the bell. And still when it rang, she jumped. It was so loud 
like an alarm clinging in danger. She tried to turn against the tide to get away while there was still time. She was caught in the chattering, laughing trap of factory girls pushing themselves forward into the new day. She gave up and allowed the press of bodies around her to propel her to the enclosed staircase and up the four flights to the weaving room. Bridget was not at her looms. Mr. Marsden was not on his high stool. Her execution was delayed. She felt relief, which was immediately swallowed up in anxiety. She needed it all to be over. One of the girls from the acre approached her. Bridget says to tell you she's feeling a wee bit poorly this morning. You are not to worry. The little coward. She's gonna let me face it all alone, eh? When I was the run, when I was the one risked all to help her? The girl glanced back over her shoulder and around the room. She bent her face close to Liddy's neck and whispered. Truth be told, she got word not to report this morning, but she had no wish to alarm you. Now Lydia was truly alarmed without even the slight armor that resentment might provide. Would they then be punishing Bridget instead of her? What sin had Bridget committed? What rule had she ever trespassed? And she with a sickly mother and nearly a dozen brothers and sisters to care for? Mr. Marsden had come in. Liddy kept her eyes carefully on her looms. The room shook and shuddered into life. Liddy and the Irish girl beyond kept Bridget's looms going between them as best they could. She was almost busy enough to suppress her fears. And then a young man, the agent's clerk in his new, neat suit and cravat, appeared at her side and asked her to come with him to the agent's office. The time had come at last. She shut down her own looms and one of Bridget's and followed the clerk down the stairs and out across the yard to the low building that housed the counting room and the offices. The agent Graves was seated at his huge roll-top desk and did not at once turn from his papers and acknowledge her presence. The clerk had only taken her as far as the door, so she just stood inside. She stood just inside as he closed it behind her. She tried to breathe. She waited like that hardly able to get a breath past her Adam's apple until she began to feel quite faint. Was she collapsed then in a heap on the rug? She studied the pattern, shades of dull browns, starting nearly black in the center and spinning out lighter and lighter to a dirty yellow at the outer edge. Dizzy, she stumbled a step forward to keep from falling. The man turned in his chair, as though annoyed. He was wearing half spectacles and he lowered his massive head and stared over them at her. You, you sent for me, sir? It came out like a hen cackle. Yes, you sent for me, sir? She was glad to hear her voice grow stronger. The man kept staring as though she were a maggot on his dish. Lydia Worthen, sir, you sent for me? Ah, yes, Miss Worthen. He neither stood nor asked her to sit down. Miss Worthen. He gathered the papers he had been working on and tamped the bottom of the pile on his desk to neaten it, and then laid the stack down on the right side of the desk. Then he scraped his chair around to face her more directly. Ms. Worthen, I've had a distressing interview with your overseer this morning. She couldn't help but wonder how Mr. Marsden had retold last night's encounter. It seems, he continued, it seems you are a troublemaker in the weaving room. He was studying her closely now, as though he had studied his papers before, or as closely as he had studied his papers before. A troublemaker, he repeated. I, sir? Yes, Mr. Marsden fears you're having a bad influence on the other girls there. So there had been no report of last night? That at least seemed clear. I do my work, sir, Liddy said, gathering courage. I have no intention of causing trouble on the floor. How long have you been with us, Miss Worthen? A year, sir, last April, sir. And how many looms are you tending at this time? Four, sir. I see, and your wages on the average? I make a good wage, sir. Lately it's been $3 above my board. Are you satisfied with these wages then? Yes, sir. I see, and the hours? I'm used to long hours, I manage. I see, and none of this, he waved a massive hand, none of this 10 hour business, eh? I never signed a petition. I meant to, but no need for you to know it. There was a long pause during which the agent took off his spectacles as though to see her better. So, he said finally, you're not one of these female reform girls. No, sir. I see, he said, replacing his spectacles and looking quite as though he saw much less than he had a few minutes before. I see. She took a tiny step forward. 
may I ask, sir, why I'm being called a troublemaker? She spoke very softly, but the agent heard her. Yes, well, maybe her heart thumped in admiration for her own boldness. Maybe Mr. Marsden could be called, sir? How is it exactly that I have displeased him? Her voice went up to soften the request into her question. Yes, well, he hesitated. Open the door. And when Liddy obeyed, he called to the clerk to serve in Mr. Marsden, then turned again to Liddy. You may sit down, Miss Worthen, he said, and went back to the papers on his desk. Though the chair he indicated was narrow and straight, she was grateful to sit down at last. The spurt of courage had exhausted her as much as her fear had earlier. She was glad, too, to have time to pull her rioting thoughts together. But the longer she waited, the greater the tumult inside her. So that when the clerk opened the door and Mr. Marsden appeared, she could only just keep from jumping up and crying out. She pressed her back into the spindles of the chair until she could almost feel the print of the wood through to her chest. She kept her eyes on the dizzying oval spiral of the rug. There was a clearing of the throat and then, you sit for me, sir? Liddy nearly laughed aloud. Her exact words, not 10 minutes before. The superintendent turned in his chair, but again, he did not stand or offer the visitor a chair. Miss Worthen here asked to know the charges against her. Mr. Marsden coughed. Liddy looked up despite herself. At her glance, the overseer blinked quickly, then composed himself, his lids hooding his little dark eyes, his rosebud mouth tightening to a slit. This one is a troublemaker, he said evenly. She leapt to her feet. She couldn't seem to stop herself. A troublemaker? Then what be you, Mr. Marsden? What be you, eh? The agent's head went up. His body was spread and his eyes bulged like a great toad poised to spring. Sit down, Miss Worthen. She sank onto the chair. Her outburst had given the overseer the time he needed. He smiled slightly as though to say, see, no lady, this one. Satisfied that he had stilled her, the agent shifted his gaze from Liddy to her accuser. A troublemaker, Mr. Marsden? For a quick moment, Liddy hoped, but the man went on. In what way a troublemaker? Her work record seems satisfactory. It is not. And now Mr. Marsden turned and glared straight at Liddy, all trace of nervousness gone. It is not her work as such, indeed. And here he gave a sad little laugh. I, at one time, thought of her as one of the best on the floor, but he turned back to the agent, his voice solemn and quiet. I am forced, sir, to ask for her dismissal. It is a matter of moral turpitude. Moral what? What was he saying? What was he accusing her of? I see, said the agent, as though all had been explained when nothing, nothing had. I cannot, and now the overseer's voice was fairly dripping with the honey of regret, for the sake of all the innocent young women in my care, I cannot have among my girls someone who sets an example of moral turpitude. Certainly not, Mr. Marsden. The corporation cannot countenance moral turpitude. She turned unbelieving from one man to the other, but they ignored her. She fought for words to counter the drift the interview had taken, but what could she say? She didn't know what turpitude was. How could she deny something she did not even know existed? She knew what moral was, but that didn't help. Moral was Amelia's territory of faithful attendance at Sabbath worship and prayer meeting and Bible study, and she couldn't ask for consideration on those counts. She hardly ever went to worship, and Lord knew when she read, it wasn't just the Bible. Still, she was no worse than many, was she? At least she was not a papist, and no one was condemning them. She opened her mouth. They were both looking at her sadly but sternly. In the silence, the battle had been lost. You may ask the clerk for whatever wages are due you, Miss Worthen, the agent said, turning to his desk. Mr. Marsden gave his superiors back a nod and tight rosebud smile. Did he click his heels? At any rate, he left quickly without another glance toward Liddy. You may go now, the agent said without turning. What could she do? She stumbled to her feet and out the door. They paid her wages full and just, but there was no certificate of honorable discharge from the Concord Corporation. And with no certificate, she would never be hired by any other corporation in Lowell. She walked out of the tall gate, benumbed. She had often dreamed of this last day, but in her dream, she would be going home in triumph. And now there was no triumph and no home to go to, even in disgrace. Okay. 
So bye bye, Liddy. Okay, so Liddy gets fired from the corporation, doesn't get an honorable discharge like Diana did. So all because of this moral turpitude. So you're going to need to think about what they mean when they say that she sets an example of moral turpitude. So moral meaning things that are right. Uh, they can't have girls uh, being examples of moral turpitude. And she doesn't even know what this means, but yet she's still dismissed with this. So think about what that means based on the context here. You're going to need to know that to be able to answer the chapter 21 questions. So when you are looking at your reading page, they should show up here as a quiz, chapter 21 comprehension questions. There should be a submit button. It says after watching the lesson video for Monday, May 11th, which is this, complete these questions for chapter 21 of Liddy. So I'm going to go to these questions. Oh, you can't see them here. Sorry, I need to go somewhere else to show you the questions. I'm going to walk through them. We'll preview as a student so you can't see the correct answers. And once I walk through them, then that'll be the end of this video and you can go ahead and go complete them. So question number one says, what does Liddy mean when she says her execution was delayed? So this is right when she goes back to work. She realizes Mr. Marsden is gone, Bridget is gone. And so she says her execution was delayed. Now you might wanna go back and look on, um, page, let's see, it was page 165, I'm sorry, 163, where she says this, after that sentence, her execution was delayed, it says she felt relief, which was immediately swallowed up in anxiety, she needed it all to be over. So think about what she means by her execution being delayed. Is she really going to get killed? What does delayed mean? Think about that before you answer that question. Uh, then where was Liddy called to go? So when the agent's clerk said, you know, we need you somewhere, where does she go? That's a pretty simple question to answer. What is Liddy accused of being? I'm looking for one word here. This is just one word. What did they say she was? Okay. Mr. Marsden said she is this. Um, does Agent Graves know what Liddy did to Mr. Marsden from the last chapter? So that's just a yes or no. Yes, he knows that she poured a bucket of water on his head or no, he doesn't know that Liddy did that. So the agent in um, the office that she goes to, does he know yes or no? When Mr. Marston says that the reason he wants Liddy to be dismissed is a matter of moral turpitude, Agent Graves agrees with him. Do you think it was right for her to be dismissed because of this? Why or why not? So this is a, a yes or no, yes or no, and then I need a because, okay? You need to give me your reason why. So yes, I think it was right for her to be, be dismissed this way, or no, I don't think it was right. Question number six, will Liddy ever work in a corporation in Lowell ever again? So this is again a yes or a no, and you need a because, because I have why or why not. Not just yes or no, give me the reason. You'll only get half points if you say yes or no. Question seven, what does the word benumbed mean as it is used on page 168? And then I have the sentence here. She walked out of the tall gate benumbed. So break down this word. Think about what word do you know already in here? Numb. What does it mean to be numb? And then you are benumbed. Think about her leaving the corporation, just getting dismissed after all the hard work she's done. What's going to be going through her? What's she going to be feeling, okay? Pick between one of those answers. Question number eight, the last one. What does the encounter with Mr. Marsden and Agent Graves tell you about the workers' rights in the mills and factories? So you can start with um, this tells me that the workers, and tell me about their rights. What does this say? If they can pull Liddy in, Mr. Marsden can just say that she, uh, it's an issue of moral turpitude and Agent Graves can agree with her, but yet she has no clue what this means. And just because Mr. Marsden says this, she's allowed to be fired. What does this tell you about their rights? Do they have a lot of rights? Do they not have a lot of rights? Uh, what is it like to work in this time period as a worker, not an overseer or an agent, but tell me what it tells you. If this can happen to Liddy, what does this mean, okay? So there's only eight questions. It's gonna be 10 points because a couple of the questions are two part questions where I have that why or why not on there. That'll, that's gonna be worth two points because you need to give me the reason why, okay? So 
you are only going to need to do chapter 21 comprehension questions in EDSBE for today's video. Now, I do want to go back to our main page here. And if we're looking, and I'm just going to do one first period, notice last week I posted that I just put in zeros for missing assignments for week two of e-learning. We're going into week seven, by the way. So I'm being very lenient with giving you zeros uh, after allowing you seven weeks to do it. That's a lot of time. And I'm still missing many assignments. So you need to make sure that you go back in and you see anything that is a zero, anything that is overdue, you need to complete it, okay? Now, in the library over here on the right side, you click it every week has the weekly lesson videos, all right? So you need to go back through and you need to make sure that you've watched every lesson video. They're only posted Monday and Wednesday, not Tuesday, not Thursday, not Friday. Monday and Wednesday, and each week in here, you need to make sure that you have watched all of them and you've completed all the assignments that go with it. Otherwise, you will get a zero and that will cause you to possibly get a D or fail my class. This is important, okay? I've put in the zeros for uh, week one. I've put in the zeros for week two. This is week one, 3.30 to 4.3. Week two, 4.6 to 4.9. So if you have zeros for those two weeks, I would go back to those two folders and see what you're missing, okay? The other weeks are in here as well. This is last week, 5.4 to 5.8, and I'm gonna put this week's in there um, right after I make this video. Okay, so please make sure you're using the library because I do make these videos. I do it for you so that you can see what you need to do and you need to make sure that you are keeping up with all of your overdue assignments and your zeros. Okay, all right, have a wonderful Monday. Please reach out, message me, ask me questions if you need it. Have a wonderful Monday.